who we are. We are here to bring a Christian perspective into the public square. So our, our mission is to see politics renewed and lives transformed. P- people are pretty sick of politics at the moment, and I, I don't particularly blame them. It feels like squabbling school children, shouting at each other across the benches, and politics seems to be about broken promises and, and sex scandals and, and all of that. But at its best, at, at its most basic and simple, politics is about people coming together to make decisions about how we live as a society. And at CARE, we, we believe that's a good thing and that God has something to say about how we do that. Now, we, we've got three main areas we work. We, uh, we equip politicians, so we have policy experts. We do research, prepare reports, write bills, draft amendments. We, we give briefings to MPs and peers. And, and we're all about people, not parties. So we, we work with all sorts of politicians, Conservative, Labour, Lib Dem, SNP, Crossbench, all of them. And, and we work on assisted suicide, modern slavery, gambling addiction, freedom of Christian belief, online safety for children, and anything where we can focus on standing up for the most vulnerable. So, so one, we equip politicians, then we engage the church, and, and that's what we're doing tonight. We, we want to help churches think well and engage with the issues, pray, vote well. So we teach on topics that are live in our national debates. We, we help you to engage with your local MP. We, we want to help Christians pray. So a lot of people really love our, our prayer diary, a, a short prayer every day to help you pray for our nation in an informed way. Do, do come and grab a, a copy from me later. And we want to help Christians vote as well. So when the election is called, we've got a, a brand new election website to help Christians to make those decisions. So that's the second strand of our work. We engage the church. And, and thirdly, we empower future leaders. So every year we have 15 university graduates from a variety of backgrounds, and we place them in Parliament to work with politicians. So, so this is the, the current batch, and they, they spend four days a week working in Parliament, and then every week they have Care Friday, and they gather in our offices for lectures and seminars and teaching on Christian ethics or Christian leadership or all sorts of things like that. We've had over 350 people go through our leadership program. One of them is now in the cabinet. Another one, Kate Forbes, almost became First Minister of Scotland last year. And, and that was really encouraging for us because it shows that what we're doing is working. We're, we're raising up a generation of leaders who are there to shine out in Christ-like ways. So those are our three E's, the, the three things we do. And our heartbeat at CARE, as we, we do all of that, is to do it with grace and truth. How we do things, how we speak, how we interact with those who, who disagree with us is as important for us as what we do. And so we always want to model speaking with humility and civility and generosity of spirit. And, and that's a, a guiding principle for our time tonight as well. We're, we're looking at a, a difficult topic tonight and it covers issues of, of life and death. And it's an a- area where people have strongly held views. And for some of you, it might bring up particularly personal things and, and difficult experiences, or maybe it's a situation you're, you're currently wrestling with with your loved ones just want to say our, our guiding principle tonight is grace and truth. Not about issues, it's about people and their lives. So if you, if you want to chat to me afterwards uh, about anything that, that comes up tonight, or indeed your, your vicar Dan, I, I know he'd be happy to uh, do talk through anything that tonight brings up. But let, let's, let's turn on to our topic for tonight. The, the former Archbishop of Canterbury, Lord Carey, he wrote to MPs last year to say that supporting assisted suicide is a profoundly Christian thing to do. This is the full quote. It is profoundly Christian to do all we can to ensure nobody suffers against their wishes. And I think that quote 
sums up some of the well-meaning confusion in the church. And Christians, we can find ourselves in a strange position when it comes to assisted suicide. And, and that's because the other side, the, the pro-assisted suicide lobby, they, they use a lot of words that, that Christians will often use. So, for example, Christian uh, assisted suicide is framed in terms of being a, a compassionate approach. And, and we want to say, well, yes, compassion. We're, we're the people of compassion, aren't we? Uh, and the arguments framed in terms of compassion pull at the heartstrings. Or in other words, dignity. So the Voluntary Euthanasia Society, not a particularly catchy name, a few years ago they rebranded themselves as Dignity in Dying. And as Christians, we're thinking, well, well, we're the ones who believe in, in human dignity. We're always talking about the dignity of every person made in the image of God. And so then when the argument is framed in terms of dignity, or in terms of compassion, it can leave us wondering, well, well, maybe there's something to all of this. And, and there are many who will think, well, I, I know assisted suicide is supposed to be bad, but I, I, I kind of see where they're coming from. Well, here's what we're going to do this evening. We're, we're going to start by laying the groundwork and just understand, well, what are we actually talking about? What's the definitions? What's, what's the law? Then look at the argument in favor of assisted suicide then some biblical principles then the argument against and then we'll finish by thinking well what, what can we what can we do what next but before we do any of that let's have a discussion time um, so we'll, we'll take a few minutes just in in groups to answer this question why do you think support for assisted suicide has risen in recent years so, so support for it seems to be higher now than it was, say, 10 years ago, 20 years ago. The, there's more talk about it, more public conversation. What, what's behind that change, do you think? Why, why is that right support rising? So you know, maybe in groups of whatever number you want, I don't mind. Um, just have a chat with your neighbor. Have a think through that. I'll give you a few minutes, and then we'll, we'll feed back with um, some suggestions. give you another minute or so, okay?
Okay, if you finish your thought, finish your sentence. And I'm going to get Dan to run around with it. Is that mic live and attached to things? Sorry. Um, yeah, so does anyone have anything really insightful that they want to share, or indeed even vaguely insightful, or maybe something someone else said you thought was really good? Um, anyone want to share anything that was said? Doesn't actually have to be insightful at all. <laughs> we talked about how society thinks they deserve. You know, that's the, the thing that you hear. You know, we've done this because she deserves it. We, you're living your life that you deserve. And it's more, instead of, they, they look at themselves and not other people. So we live in quite a selfish, godless society. And so, given the choice, people are taking it. You know, that I'm entitled to do this. That's really interesting, anything. isn't it? There's a, a greater focus on self, if, if this is something I want, then that's the only consideration. Yeah, that's really, really good. And anyone else want to join the discussion, add, add anything else in? Anyone say any, any, in your group say anything really stupid? You, you can share that as well. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. <laughs> <laughs> it's a complex issue, obviously, but... Um, Maybe people are seeing it as the easy option. Yeah, so a an easy option because actually face when you're faced with incredible suffering, that, that is hard. And if you maybe don't have faith to, to kind of get you through that, you think there's a, there's a way out. That's understandable, isn't it? You've got to see where people are coming from with that. Um, yeah, over there. Uh, we talked about a couple of things. Uh, one of them is that probably it's talked about more than it would have been previously. Um, maybe things were more hidden uh, yeah. way back than it is now. A lot of things are talked about now where they would be kept hidden. Uh, and the second one um, was a little bit similar to Jane's, really, uh, but more about rights uh, in that, you know, as women's rights have grown and all of the other rights have kind of come through, well, this is our right, you know, yeah. to do this. If it's my life, then it's my right also to opt for this. And then finally, we said um, that if you see other people that you look up to and that you... Um, that you think, well, you know, they are kind of promoting mm. that, uh, saying it, but also other countries accepting it, well, why are we different on that? Yeah. Why would we not be doing it if other places are accepting it as well? That's brilliant points then. Like the power of celebrity endorsements, that, that's, a, that's a real thing, isn't it? Should we, should we finish right here at the front? And One of the things we talked about was people are living physically much longer yeah. than they ever did before, but at the same time, their quality of life is not towards the end, is... is um, often now uh, seized by, you know, was it dementia or m motor neurons disease or, or whatever it may be. And in a way that perhaps we've not seen before, some of that is, is causing new questions to arise. Yeah, that's really, that's really helpful. Yeah. yeah, thank you. Right, well... I think there's some really good answers there, but, but let, let's move on to now to the, the most exciting part of the talk, which is definitions. Now, actually, this is really important because what often happens is there is a, a, a kind of blurring of language, deliberate ambiguity where words and phrases can be used sometimes to obscure the reality of what's going on. And so if we're going to talk about this for, for an hour tonight, we, it's, it's good to get some terms clear. So I'll just put a few on the screen and we'll, we'll work through them. The, the first one I've put up there is mercy killing. So this is when, when someone kills another person in order to end their suffering. So an example would be the case of David Hunter. It's been in and out of the news the last few years. David was a, a former coal miner from Northumberland. He was married to his wife Janice for 56 years. Uh, when they retired, they moved to Cyprus. She became increasingly unwell. She suffered from blood cancer and 
she was in a great deal of pain and her life became more and more unbearable. She wanted to end her suffering. She wanted to die and she would repeatedly beg David to take her life. And eventually, after she had begged him many, many times, that's what he did in in 2021. He ended her suffering by smothering her with a pillow. He was initially convicted of of murder. It was later reduced to manslaughter. But that's an example of of mercy killing. The the next word on on there is euthanasia. It's it's from Greek. It literally means good death. Uh, And what euthanasia is, is when a doctor administers an injection which contains a lethal dose of barbiturates or, or some other drug. It has the effect of putting the the patient into a coma and bringing about a swift death. And euthanasia is framed as better than mercy killing because it's more clinical, uh, but it's still an intentional act that kills someone. Next up is assisted suicide. And, And that is where the doctor hands the lethal drug to the patient, but the patient then administers it themselves. So the doctor is still heavily involved, but doesn't take the final act. And assisted suicide is still illegal in this country as well. And finally, assisted dying. It's a a phrase used by a lot of people who are campaigning for the law to be changed. Uh, Assisted dying sounds better than assisted suicide. And they say it differs from assisted suicide in that assisted dying is for people who are dying anyway. Say you've, you've got a couple of months left to live. But in law and in practice, it's exactly the same as assisted suicide. It's, it's the same act, that the medic hands the drug to the patient, the patient then uses it to end his or her life. And at CARE, we, we really try and steer away from that phrase, assisted dying. We urge Christians not to use it because at some level it's shrouding the reality of what's happening. Now, everything on the screen so far is it has been illegal in this country, but there are some actions that doctors take that on, on the surface can seem similar, but are very different from an ethical standpoint. So, for example, a, a do not resuscitate order, a DNR. These were really controversial during COVID, weren't they? A DNR was added to a lot of patients' records that they'd agreed to this DNR when they hadn't. That's unethical, completely wrong. But a DNR is in a different category from the things on the left. Those are, are positive acts with the intention of ending a life. A DNR is a decision not to act, not to give someone CPR if they stop breathing or their heart stops beating. And this is a a painful and difficult decision to make, but often it can be the right decision. It's in the same category as withdrawing medical treatment, saying we've done all we can we're just prolonging life at the moment. We're, we're going to stop doing that. Perhaps we're, we're not going to give treatment that, that could extend the duration of life but diminish the quality of life. No, we're going to switch our focus to managing pain instead. And that, that's, that's a hard decision again, but completely legitimate. Again, it's the, the difference between an, an act that kills and an act that takes a life and a decision not to act. Sometimes I hear of Christians who, because they believe in the sanctity of human life, they they feel that they should pursue every possible medical intervention, not not because they want to, but because they feel as Christians that they have to. But, But that's not what the Bible tells us. Stopping the fight when the body is ready to die is sometimes the wisest option. And actually, it can be a Christian option because we know that death is not the end, so we don't have to delay it as long as we possibly can. And then when medical treatment is withdrawn, that doesn't mean you just sit there and wait. There's a whole medical discipline called palliative care. We'll we'll come to it later. It was pioneered by a Christian. But it's about holistically caring for the dying person. 
minimizing pain, hel- helping them to prepare for the end of life. And that can include powerful drugs and medication. But the intention there is not to kill, it's, n- it's not to end the life, it's to ease pain. And that's a, a crucial distinction. So that's kind of the definitions. Let's, let's move on to the law. Globally, this is the, the picture. The, the countries in green have legalized euthanasia. Remember, that's when the, the doctor does the, the final act. That includes Canada, most parts of Australia, Colombia, Netherlands, Belgium, and Luxembourg. Those in purple have legalized assisted suicide. So that includes a lot of US states, Austria, Switzerland, famously Switzerland. And then the yellow, that's parliaments in Germany and Italy, they've been ordered to introduce some form of assisted suicide by the courts in those countries. Closer to home, in in Jersey, MPs have approved assisted suicide in principle. In the Isle of Man, there is an assisted dying bill going through the parliament at the moment. And in Scotland, a bill was introduced, I want to say three weeks ago, it might be two. In the UK at the moment, mercy killing, euthanasia, that they fall under the law for murder or manslaughter. But assisted suicide at the moment is a criminal act. So the, the Suicide Act, 1961, a, a person commits an offence if he does an act capable of encouraging or assisting the suicide or attempted suicide of another person. And the act was intended to do, to do that. Now, prosecutions under that act are pretty rare. In the last 14 years, only four people have been prosecuted under that law and none of them had anything to do with trying to ease the suffering of their loved ones. But nonetheless, there's been a, a campaign for decades to to change the law and make assisted suicide legal. So at CARE, we've been involved in defeating over 10 different assisted suicide bills in the last 20 years. The last big push was in 2015, and it was defeated in the House of Commons, resoundingly. But as I'm sure you've seen in the news, there's a, a new campaign the, the weekly articles, often from celebrities, media figures, arguing for law change. There's that bill just introduced in the Scottish Parliament. So there's this well-funded campaign to change the law in the UK. There's, a, there's an often cited statistic saying that 84% of the public support the choice of assisted dying for terminally ill adults. And that's a really misleading statistic because in follow-up questions, it becomes really clear people don't know what assisted dying is. That's, that's why we, we really want to be really clear on the terminology. Once it's explained what is assisted dying and when some of the dangers of assisted dying slash suicide are explained, as we'll do this evening, the figure in favor drops rather dramatically. 43% in favor. It's still quite a lot. It's still going to be a big issue in the next few years but it's not quite as overwhelming as we first thought. So that is the groundwork. That's just kind of getting some terms out there so we all know what we're talking about for the rest of our evening. Let's move on to the pro argument, the argument in favor of assisted suicide. And it's always important, I I think, to, to represent the other side fairly and well. There's no point us all coming here tonight and just caricaturing the other side uh, and putting up a straw man, tearing it down, and uh, we all feel good about ourselves, but we haven't really engaged with the argument. So let's try and understand, what is the argument for assisted suicide? Uh, And it basically boils down to three categories. We need it, we want it, and we can control it. So firstly, we need it. You, You could call this the compassion arguments. Look at the unimaginable suffering that some people are going through. This is the the main argument you'll read about in the stories. From the Dignity and Dying website, there's a story written by a lady named Heather. I have read this dozens and dozens of times, and it gets me every time. She 
It says, my mum was 79 when she died from cancer. She was one of those brave people who never complain. The radiotherapy treatment for her cancer left her with third degree burns and lying down was particularly painful. She was so sore sitting down that she ate standing up and then doctors found a tumor blocking her stomach so she could no longer digest food. She spent her final week in hospital. She couldn't take fluids by mouth. She was in great pain from the radiation burns and tumors and all the tubes she was dealing with. She couldn't speak. She would regularly hold two fingers to her mouth in the motion of a gun. My mum had a massive turnout at her funeral and everyone who contacted me afterwards said what a kind and funny person she was. She had a great life and an absolutely horrible death. The first strand of the argument says, look at the incredible suffering that some people endure. And they rightly want to alleviate that suffering. They want to end that suffering. That there's no medical treatment. It's only getting worse with time. We, we could do something about this. So in the name of compassion, we need the law to change. That's argument one. Next argument is we want it. Autonomy argument. We, we talked about this a little bit earlier, didn't we? Why shouldn't we be able to choose when I die? To, to quote the poem Invictus, I am the master of my fate. I am the captain of my soul. You say, I, maybe I don't believe in God. Who are you to deny me the right to end my life in the time of my choosing? Sir, Sir Patrick Stewart, the, uh, he's a patron for the lobby group Dignity in Dying. He said, we, we have no control over how we arrive in the world, but at the end, we should have control over how we leave it. Or Debbie a lady who was diagnosed with progressive MS at the age of just 31. I love my life, but I've always been a fiercely independent woman and I want to have a choice about how and when I die. It seems reasonable, doesn't it? It, it all comes back to, to J.S. Mill of the Enlightenment. Over himself, over his body and mind, the individual is sovereign. So we, we need it in the name of compassion. We, we want it. I have the right to it. And, and thirdly, we, we can control it. Slippery slope on the picture there. It's the public policy argument. Campaigners say, look, we, we, we understand this could be a slippery slope if we don't do it properly. We, we've heard stories from other nations, but we've got the right safeguards. If we do this our way, the law will never be abused, never misused. It won't be a slippery slope. So we, we need it. We want it. We can control it. And, and I do think we need to acknowledge the strength of those arguments in today's world. That first one, the, the compassion argument. It's so powerful because who doesn't want to reduce suffering? And, and to look someone in the eye who, who's begging for the law to be changed so they can be put out of their suffering and just saying no is, is brutal. And if the third argument is true, that we can control it, then, then why shouldn't we allow it? Why should my morality stop others from having what they want? It's like the argument many used when same-sex marriage was legalized. If you don't believe in same-sex marriage, don't have one. But this is the same. You don't believe in assisted suicide? Well, 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 don't use it, but don't stop us from doing it. And some, as Christians, sometimes we can think, well, well, maybe you're right. After all, I, I don't want to impose my morality. And here's the thing. No, we, we don't want to impose our morality, but we do want to love our neighbor. So, what we're going to do in the next little section is we're just going to think about some of the biblical principles about how we can love our neighbor. What, what does the Bible say about assisted suicide? What biblical principles affect the assisted suicide debate? And, and actually, let's take an, I haven't got a slide for this, but let's take another brief discussion time 
Um, just to answer the question, what biblical principles can you think of that would apply to this debate? So what Bible verses or Bible themes would apply to this debate? So again, take a couple of minutes and, and more feedback. We'll do another 30 seconds or so. Okay. So Dan's going to run around with a microphone again. Anyone got any, any biblical principles that might apply in any way, however tangential, to the question of assisted suicide? Um, the one that came to me was um, from Job. The Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Yeah, the Lord gives life, the Lord takes yeah. life. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Uh, we, talked, we talked about the, the verse that um, says, oh, I can't oh, your days are numbered. Your name, your, num your name is written in the Lamb's book of life, and your yeah. days are numbered. Yeah, so Psalm 139, you know, yeah. every one of them is written in the Lord's book. Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. Anyone at the back? This is straight off the top of the head, but I mean, I'm thinking of when Paul was out at sea and somebody was going to kill themselves, and and he's he was dead against that happening. So um, I missed the first half of that. Sorry, I was thinking about the 
where, where Paul was out at sea and he was going to be shipwrecked. Yeah. Uh, and somebody there tried, was, was about to end his life and um, Paul was dead against that. And uh, I, as you say, life is precious. But I know, um, for Paul it would have been gain, wouldn't it? Yeah. End of shipwreck. Live as, Christ, live as Christ to die as gain, but he's like, no, I don't want that. Yeah, great, great answer. Right. We had Jim at Do Not Kill. Do Not Kill. The <laughs> that's, that's a simple one, isn't it? Um, we also had others. <laughs> yeah. We just kept firing them quite quickly, so. Our times are in his hands. Our times are in his hands, yeah. So a lot of them falling under that theme of, of all our days beginning to end being under God's hands. Yeah, Hannah. Oh. Uh, today I've given you the choice between life and death. Choose life so that you and your descendants might live from Joshua. Yeah, that's a good one. I, I, I'm going to sum up three principles um, to put on the screen. First one, life is valuable. As humans, we are made in the image of God, aren't we? That's the, the most incredible truth. We are like God, created in his image in a way that no animal is. We, we reflect his glory in a way that not even the stars or the planets are able to. And in Genesis 9, it's because we are made in the image of God that taking a human life is such a somber and serious act. God says, whoever sheds human blood, by humans shall their blood be shed. For in the image of God has God made mankind. So he's saying you know, that should never be done lightly because we're made in the image of God. So our first principle, life is valuable. Secondly, covered this, God gives and takes life. Here we go, Psalm 139. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. Or Hannah's song, 1 Samuel 2. The Lord brings death and makes alive. He brings down to the grave and raises up. There are two instances in the Bible of euthanasia where someone asks someone else to kill them. Neither is portrayed positively. One of them's in the book of Judges, and I'm sure we all know the general rule of thumb with the book of Judges is if they do it in Judges, it's a bad idea. The other one's King Saul. He's, he's mortally wounded. He, he asks his servant to end his suffering by running him through with a sword, but the servant refuses. Later, however, an Amalekite claims to have done the deed, probably untruthfully. But what he says is, Saul said to me, stand here by me and kill me. I'm in the throes of death, but I'm still alive. So I stood beside him and killed him because I knew that after he had fallen, he could not survive. So that's, that's a, a, a euthanasia right there, isn't it? It's, it? Or mercy killing, either way. It's, it's taking the life because oh, he can't survive. He's, he's dying anyway. I'm putting him out of his suffering. But the Amalekite is not then praised for his mercy and compassion, but he is condemned as guilty of murder. But compare that with Job. He, he pleads with God to take his life due to unbearable suffering. Oh, that I might have my request that God would be willing to crush me, to let loose his hand and cut off my life. He, he longs for death, but he doesn't take matters into his own hands or ask another to do so. So it's for God to give and take life. The third principle that I think should guide our thinking is that we must stand up for the weak and the vulnerable. Evidence from all over the world shows that time and time again, they are the victims when the law is changed. It's the elderly who are pressured by their families because they don't want to care for them or they don't want their inheritance in 20 years, they want it now. It's the poor who are told there isn't funding for their health condition, but there is funding for assisted suicide. It's the des disabled who are told their lives are no longer worth protecting. It's those with mental health struggles who are told their lives are no longer worth saving or fighting for, but just go ahead. And in some countries, it's children who are not old enough to consent to a tattoo, but who are led by misguided adults to their own deaths. A verse we keep coming back to at CARE is Proverbs 31. Speak up for those who cannot speak for themselves. Stand up for the rights of all who are destitute. Speak up and judge fairly. Defend the rights of the poor and needy. And if that's imposing my morality, then I suppose guilty as charged. So, so those are some biblical principles. It's good that we understand them. It's good that we're ready to argue them. But back to our overview, 
we, we, we've done the, the groundwork, the definitions, we've seen the, the pro argument, the, the biblical position, but now we're going to move on to the con argument because our best approach isn't always just to quote Bible verses at people. So sometimes it is, sometimes that's less effective and it's about knowing your audience a little bit. So another approach is to look at those three categories for assisted, uh, assi for assisted suicide and unravel them a little bit. So, so working backwards, we could just look at the last one. We, we can control it. The reality is we, we can't control it. Slippery slope arguments do get a bad reputation and sometimes they're really flawed. A, a flawed slippery slope argument assumes that the minute you step onto the slippery slope, you're, you're guaranteed to go all the way to the bottom. But sometimes the slippery slope argument is valid. When, when you start down the slope, you, you do keep slipping further and further. So you've got to ask, well, what would stop us from slipping? That's how you assess whether it's a, a good argument or not. Once you've introduced assisted suicide, that's safe for anyone with less than a year to live. What's, what would stop you from going to two years or, or five years? There's, there's no real logical difference at that stage. So what happens is you, you move a bit further down the slope. Or what happens when the court case is brought by the person who's got a, a lifelong condition, but it's not terminal? This happened in Canada in, in 2021. Some people with disabilities filed a lawsuit saying they were being discriminated against because they didn't have the same rights as people who were already dying. And, and they won. And so that there wasn't a strong restraint to stop you slipping further down the slope. So assisted suicide or euthanasia became available for anyone with a disability. And this has happened in every country which has legalized assisted suicide or euthanasia. The criteria are expanded over time. In Canada, it's now any significant disability or disease, even if not life-threatening. And there's now popular support in Canada for homelessness being a new criteria as well. In the Netherlands, it started with incurable illness, but now people have been euthanized for loneliness. And in the news late last year, five people euthanized in the Netherlands for the sole factor of having autism. There's going to be expansion of the criteria because any limits by their very nature are arbitrary. And I think there's an, an institutional arrogance that says we won't be like that. Age goes down. This is less inevitable. There are more natural restraints that might stop you slipping down the slope, but in some countries, the age has gone down to the point where in the Netherlands, the, the legal limit for euthanasia is one year old, and in Belgium, there is no lower limit. And then numbers go up year on year, more people access it. So in Canada, it was legalized in 2016. In the first year, it was 1,018 people, but six years later, it was 13,000 people. So it's like Pandora's box. We, we can't control it. Second argument, remember, was we want it. But wanting it isn't enough. The decisions we make impact others, don't they? No man is an island. It's not just a, a private decision between me and my doctor. It has all sorts of unintended consequences that, that ripple out into society and affect other people's lives. But, and that's what this is about. It's about people. So legalizing assisted suicide has some of the following impacts. It, it changes the nature of health care. Many, many of you would have heard of uh, John Wyatt, a prominent Christian ethicist. He's written lots on this kind of issues. He, he's come up with what he calls the first rule of health economics and that is the cheapest patient is a dead patient he talks about how in over the last few decades there's been a, a shift it used to be if you wanted some kind of treatment that the gatekeeper was your, your doctor or physician you had to get past them and if they well, if you convinced them then you would get the treatment but now so much more it's controlled by cost and the NHS is in, in financial difficulty it's it's all the more reason not to open the door to assisted suicide because you could, and many people would be told, well, we can't fund your treatment, but have you thought about 
assisted suicide because treatment's always more costly than killing. And, and the relationship between health provider and patient fundamentally changes if you open the door. Second, it, it changes our view of mental health. So in every, in every country where assisted suicide has been legalized, other suicides have also increased. We, we, we usually say as a society we want to reduce the number of people taking their own lives. And we commend the brave people who risk everything to, to save people trying to harm themselves, don't we? And there have been amazing increases in funding for mental health services because we recognize people need support in their darkest moments. The majority of people with mental illnesses do get better. But with, with a change in the law, what happens is you end up saying some people's lives are worth saving and, and some not. In The Guardian, one columnist, Martha Gill, wrote, if, if you see someone headed determinedly for the edge of a cliff, do you rush to stop them? Or do you respect their autonomous decision and help them on their way? What makes some lives worth saving and others not? Changes our view of disability. Uh, all disability groups uh, advocate against the change in the law because disability becomes a problem to be solved rather than people to be cared for and loved. I find myself agreeing with uh, Humza Yusuf recently. Doesn't happen often, the, the First Minister of Scotland. He recently hardened his opposition to assisted suicide because of the campaigns of disability groups. Uh, again, from Canada, there are reports from disabled groups of people who feel pressured into considering assisted suicide by hospital staff because the subject is ra raised, raised with them repeatedly. Next up, it changes our relationship with the poor. So that the rich are the campaigners for assisted suicide, the, the poor are the victims. Let me tell you about Rosina. She's, again, Canada. She was uh, lonely and isolated. She had fibromyalgia, various psychiatric disorders. And her disability benefits were so low that she couldn't get proper pain medication or housing. She wasn't uh, technically eligible for assisted suicide, but she applied anyway, and she was approved, and she was killed a few days later. Later, a friend found a note from her, and this is what she wrote. The suffering I experience is mental, not physical. It's the constant worrying about not having enough food to eat. I think if more people cared about me, I would have been able to handle the suffering caused by my physical illnesses alone. Do I think euthanasia is the only solution? Probably not, but it's the only solution here in Canada because the government doesn't give you enough money to survive. It's the, it's the rich who campaign for assisted suicide because they, they want control over their own deaths, but it's the poor who are pressured into it because they have no other option. Number five, it, it changes our view of ourselves. I, I wonder how many of you have ever been told by an elderly relative, I, I don't want to be a burden. And that now people are being given the option not to be a burden anymore. In, in the state of Oregon in the US, 50% of people gave that as one of their reasons for choosing to kill themselves, not being a burden. Hey, well, as Christians, we know that we, we come into the world as burdens. We leave the world as burdens, and at various times in our lives, we bear one another's burdens. I, I, my plea is for, for us to ditch the phrase once and for all, I don't want to be a burden, and, and do everything we can to avoid being a society where we would rather choose to die than be a burden to others. And then, lastly, under this point, it, it changes our relationship with death, sort of. I say sort of because only Jesus changes our relationship with death. But by making assisted suicide an option, it's, it's giving us a, a power that most of us don't want or need and actually increases the existential anguish about what we should do. It, it creates an option that was never there before. And it can be really difficult as people have to then wrestle with a whole series of questions that they never had to in the past. Those are all unintended consequences. We, we haven't really covered those who might use it as an opportunity for maliciousness. But perhaps you, you could sum it up with what uh, 
Pruleith wrote, she, Bake Off Pruleith. Uh, she wrote in the Times a couple of weeks ago. She, she's a, a major campaigner for assisted suicide. But she wrote this about her worries. What if it became the morally right thing to do for old people to stop being a burden and to get out of the way? Many old people already feel like a burden on their families and society. And it's true that we, the old, are living longer, demanding ever more expensive treatment, occupying NHS beds. Could it become culturally unacceptable to stay alive if you're of no use to anyone? Could such thinking really take root? And what if the bean counters in the the NHS start to pressurize the system to take the cheapest, simplest, quickest option? Wouldn't it be easy to persuade vulnerable people at the lowest moment in life to do what the man in the white coat says. She's surprisingly honest there about her worries about changing the law, but her answer to those fears, she basically dismisses it in a sentence and says, but that wouldn't happen here. (laughs) But I think the evidence from around the world is that is what happens. Matthew Paris is a a journalist in the Times. He's, He's even worse. He He wrote, I think two weeks ago, he says, what I've described tonight will happen, but also he says, that's not a problem. He says, your time is up, will never be in order, but may one day be the kind of unspoken hint that everybody understands, and that's a good thing. It's all the changes in our attitudes towards death and life that come in when you legalize this. Lastly, there's the the we need it argument What about the unimaginable suffering? We should never be blasé in the face of that. But there are other ways of dealing with suffering rather than eliminating the sufferer. Suffering is viewed as the ultimate evil, isn't it? To be removed at all costs. And And it is an evil. It is a reflection of what's wrong with the world. But the solution is not to eliminate the sufferer. What we need is not assisted suicide or euthanasia, but palliative care the, the medical emotional spiritual care given to someone who's terminally ill reducing suffering it's not curing the illness but it's aimed at, at caring for people in their, in their darkest days it was pioneered like I said earlier by a Christian Dame Cicely Saunders she, she founded the first modern day hospice in 1967 and she built this model of palliative care which was about caring for the, the whole person the practically, spiritually, emotionally financially, all of those things and, and here's the thing with palliative care it, it often works. It usually works. I've spoken with, with palliative care nurses and, and they say that in almost every case, with proper hospice care, pain can be managed and death can be dignified without changing the, the funda- fundamental dynamics of healthcare and society. Cicely Saunders, she, she had this beautiful vision for caring for every individual. She says, you matter because you are you. And you matter until the end of your life. We will do all we can, not only to help you die peacefully, but to live until you die. I think that's so beautiful and hopeful in comparison to the message of assisted suicide. Now, we're not naive. We know there's more to be done in the world of palliative care, and the UK is a world leader, but there needs to be more funding, and at the moment, it kind of depends on where you live, whether you get the support you need. And we also know, okay, good palliative care is not going to eliminate all suffering, and it, it won't make every death easy, and it won't eliminate some horrendous cases, but it's a holistic and hopeful approach that does make a difference to people's deaths. Yes, assisted suicide is presented as you know, neat and clean and easy. It's an attempt to control one of the most uncontrollable parts of the human story, and it doesn't deliver. But hey, in, in the end, we, we don't just need palliative care. We need resurrection hope. This is the true solution to suffering, We know that even the worst suffering is small in comparison to the eternal weight of glory that awaits us. Romans 8, 18. 
I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed in us. See, ultimately what we need is, is resurrection. When this perishable body must put on the imperishable, this mortal body must put on immortality. When the perishable puts on the imperishable and the mortal puts on immortality, then shall come to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. Oh, death, where is your victory? Oh, death, where is your sting? That's what ultimately will defeat the power of death. And until then, nothing else will manage to. Lastly, before question time, just uh, what can we do? Some positive things Christians can do about this. Number one is be clear. That's what tonight's been about. Understand the debate, understand the arguments, be aware when you know, stories are being told one side or the other to, to sway our points of view. Number two, be hopeful. I want to be really clear. There is not an inevitability to the law being changed on this. It doesn't always split along the usual kind of right-left Lines. When this last came before the House of Commons in 2015, it was resoundingly defeated. And a lot of MPs actually said, I planned on voting one way, but after hearing the arguments in letters from my constituents, or maybe for some of them, after hearing arguments on the day in the House of Commons, they changed their vote. You know, there are more and more warning signs from the other nations that have done this, so, so be hopeful be praying at care we, we produce fantastic prayer resources I've got some at the back 10 ways to pray for the end of life uh, do grab some of them be partners with us at care S you know, sign up to our mailing list stay up to date uh, be proactive you know, when the time comes and it, it will come in the next couple of years write to your MP write graciously and clearly and yeah, persuasively. M most MPs are surprisingly open to discussion on this. But most importantly, be loving. See, as, as Christians, we know at the heart of this debate are people who are suffering, some who are lonely, some who need support and help. You know, around, as you look around the world, those are the reasons for assisted suicide, those most common reasons and what can the church offer to people who are suffering or lonely or in pain? We can offer love. We can offer ourselves. And we, we say people are made in the image of God. We can show that we believe that in the way we come alongside people and love them and invest in them. We can bear one another's burdens. No, we can't take every bit of pain away. No, we can't make someone's death nice and easy but we can love them to the end we can visit the elderly people in our congregations and spend time with them you see we're not only at care we're not only against assisted suicide we are for loving our neighbor let me finish with a quote before we move on to questions it's from an american theologian stanley Hauerwas. i say in a hundred years if Christians are known as a strange group of people who don't kill their children or c and don't kill the elderly, we would have done a great thing. It may not sound like much, but it's the ultimate politic. If we can be a community who, through the worship of God, is ready to be hospitable to new life and life that is suffering, then that is a political alternative that otherwise the world will not have. Thank you for listening. I really enjoy questions, so hopefully you've either put some on Slido or you're ready just to take the microphone, but I'm going to hand over to Dan just to kind of manage the, the question-y part. A moment ago, well, two minutes ago one came in. I was still trying to phrase mine, so I might ask mine as after. You don't like else. phrasing questions, do you? <laughs> the first <laughs> it's just it's wording it. Um, <laughs> does euthanasia drugs always work? Or are there examples of times it has gone wrong? How long does it really take? That's a great question. I'm not aware of stories of where it's gone wrong. 
Um, I would imagine that probably are some, but on the whole, I think they are effective and work well. Mm. Um, when what is promised and the stories are, that are told, you know, for example, let's take a, a clinic in Switzerland where you can go to end your life is that, you know, you have your family around you, they give you the drug, you drift into a sleep, and that's that. Um, I don't have data on how accurate that is. I wonder, Hannah, if you were able to add to that? There's a group of doctors who campaign and speak against uh, euthanasia, and they do have data on this. Yeah, and I think it's quite a high percentage. Is um, it? I, I wouldn't like to put the figures on it, but I think sort of 20% where it can be 40 minutes, it can be painful, there can be vomiting, okay. um, people need a second shot. It, the second shot might not be available. They, can they then give consent if they're sedated to have a second shot? What if they wake up halfway through and change their minds? Uh, do you, did you then institute emetic treatments to make them sick? So, yeah, there is, there is data and there are, um, there are horror stories, but I, I couldn't put percentages on it and I wouldn't yeah. like to use them as a big part of this argument. So. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I, I didn't want to speak on something I, I yeah. didn't have the, the figures on. Um, yeah. Well, I'm not like rushing out the door. So if you if you want to chat to me more at the back, please do. If if I can just kind of make a, a little sort of plea at the end, you, you can sign up to follow us on socials and everything. But um, we we value the support of, of people like you, churches like this, so much. Um, it's what en we've been doing. What we're doing for 40 years. It's what enables us to keep going. Um, so if you want to just sign up to receive emails from us, I've got a form at the back. Um, that would be such a blessing and help to us. It, it not only do you stay informed, but it also helps in our meetings with politicians. When we can say, well, we've got this number of Christians who subscribe to our emails, that gives us influence, that gives us weight. So if, if you're able to just fill in one of these forms at the back and just thrust it into my hand, you'll get emails from us. That serves us and it serves you, uh, if that's something you'd like to do. But I just want to thank you for your time tonight. Thank you for your attention, to, to listening. Thank you for your welcome. Um, it's been lovely to be here. Thanks so much, Pete, for everything that you've given of yourself. Um, thank you to everyone who has shared um, yeah. either in um, personal conversations or in the wider group um, uh, things that you have, experiences you've been through, but also experiences you're going through. Um, so let's just wrap this night up in prayer. Yeah. Jesus, we thank you that you spoke into being everything and before the very creation of the world you knew us and loved us and chose us um, Jesus we thank you for our creation and we thank you for that day when we do leave this earth you will be waiting for us ready to take us into the next so Jesus to you we commit ourselves and our loved ones I pray that tonight you would bless us with a great night's sleep, that tomorrow we would wake refreshed and ready to join you in everything you're calling us to do. Mm. Lord, we pray you'd continue to bless uh, the work of care and Pete. Lord, would you bless his family. Um, and Lord, as we go from this place, we go in your love and in your name. Amen. 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 Thank you so much for being with us. I have recorded tonight. I will delete the question and answers from that. Um, so if you see it pop up in the news sheet next week saying, um, have a watch of this. I've got to check that the recording is recorded properly. <laughs> um, but if it has, um, just in case you've shared something in that question and answer session that you wouldn't want to be shared elsewhere, um, please know it won't be. <laughs> so, um, yeah, thank you.